My name is Tess Opferman. I am conducting this interview for the Nevada Women's History Project. Today is August 11th, 2017, and we are here in Reno, Nevada to interview Sue Wagner, the first elected female lieutenant governor of the state of Nevada. She also served many years in the Nevada State Legislature. This interview is made possible by the Robert Z. Hawkins Foundation. Well, Sue, first of all, I want to thank you so much for being willing to be interviewed. Um, and I know I'm especially excited to be able to be the one who is interviewing you. To start, I want to hear a little bit about your formative years, hear about your parents and your siblings, the family dynamics and where you grew up. So if you could tell me a little bit about I that. I would be happy to. Uh, I grew up in, uh, in Maine to begin with. I was born in Portland, Maine. And uh, my family had to move to Arizona because of my father's health. He was a pharmacist, had his own drug store in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, which is close to Portland. And my mother was a piano teacher. And uh, I have a brother and a sister, both alive. My sister is 12 years older than myself, so she's 89. She lives in Flagstaff. My brother is uh, 85, and he lives in California. And we've all been interested in politics to some extent. My dad was uh, chairman of the Republican Party in the state of Maine at one time and one of our United States Senators, who was kind of a role model for me, was Margaret Chase Smith, who was our United States Senator. And that was a long time ago. That's in the 40s when I lived in Maine. And, uh, but we've all been interested, because of my dad's involvement, in politics in one way or the other, mainly by maybe being a precinct captain or, or being a, you know, involved in some campaign. No one but myself has actually run for office before. Well, good. And you, you were a lot younger than your siblings. You said eight years younger than your brother and 12 than your sister. How did that shape the family, being the baby in the family? Well, you know, um, I don't know because I've, I've only been the baby in the family. So I don't know what it would be like to the, be the middle or the older child. But I think that I will say this, that uh, my sister, uh, who is 89, lives in Flagstaff, Arizona. Every time I had some tragic thing happen in my life, she was there um, when I first ran for office in 1974. My children were three and four. My husband was gone all summer. She came out, took care of the kids for about six weeks while I campaigned. Um, when my husband was killed in an airplane crash, she came out, left her own family behind because she also had two children, came out, took care of me for another six weeks. Then when I was in a plane crash, she came out again and took care of me for another six weeks. So. Needless to say, she and I are pretty darn close. Mm -hmm. My brother, uh, I am more so now, right now, than I was through a period of, of, of my life because I was very involved in, in my own life and he, has, he had six children, so he was pretty much preoccupied. He also had a small oil company uh, that he owned, so he was also busy in that way. And I read a story when you were young about how you borrowed your sister's bicycle. And I think it's especially good in how it connects to now your political career. So maybe you could tell us that story. Yeah, that is a great story about the fact that my sister had a bicycle, <clears throat> brand new Schwinn, which was top of the line. And uh, that was a big deal uh, for our family to get my sister this premier bicycle. It was in the garage and I was told, never touch it, never ride it, never look at it never dust it, don't even get near it. So of course I did, didn't do, I did all those things. I took it, drove it over to the next street and put it on a little curb that was like a little bluff, put the kickstand down and went off to play with some other kids. When I came back, I couldn't find the bike. Unfortunately, it was under a car that had driven over it. The kickstand was not screwed in totally. And so the kickstand didn't work and fell down this big Buick drove over it, but the man in the car was a short little guy, but he also happened to be an illegal bookie. And so because this was reported to the police, he got caught doing what he was not supposed to be doing. But I unfortunately got into a lot of trouble. And so since my dad had a drug store, he wanted, me to, he wanted to teach me how it was hard to, to make a living and how every little penny counted. So. Uh, I got a little basket of candy bars that he sold at the grocery store and he sold them for five cents. That was the price in those days. And uh, he got a penny off of it. So that's what I was, that's what I had to raise money to buy my sister a new bicycle. 
So I went out and knocked on everybody's door in a large area in South Portland, Maine. And of course, I embellished the story as I went along. So people really felt sorry for me. So they bought lots of candy. And I was on their circuit like every other week or so. And uh, so I, I finally got to a certain amount and my family decided that was sufficient. And uh, so they, they bought my sister another bicycle. But I think it was my first experience of knocking on people's doors and asking them to buy something. In that case, it was a candy bar. Later on in my life, it was to vote for me. So I thought that was a good experience. Absolutely. Do you think you <laughs> learned a lot going door to door as a kid? That yeah, then you yeah, I did. I, I did learn a lot going to door to door. I think I learned how some people can be very pleasant. Some people may not be. They might not want to be bothered. But I also learned how, uh, how difficult it was to make money, how you had to work really hard to make a penny. And that's always stood with me, that how hard it was for my dad when you think that he had his own drugstore and everything. But it all, it all boiled down to a penny here and a penny there. I was born in Portland, Maine, uh, January 6, 1940. I remember it specifically because now when you call a doctor, you've got to say 1640 or whatever date you are so they can check your records. Um, and as I said before, that we lived in Maine. I lived there for about 10 years before my dad's health um, made it necessary for us to move west to go to a drier climate, and we chose Tucson, Arizona. Um, I had gone to school, elementary school, in South Portland, Maine, and, um, and I moved when I was in the fifth grade, was 10 years old, and I had a very strong New England accent. And so when I, you know, I entered this brand new school and no one had ever heard anybody talk like me, so I was nominated to give the weather report, this report, and, and I thought everybody really liked me when I found out it was just so they could laugh at my accent. I was kind of disappointed. But I then went to, um, to a middle school and, and high school in Tucson, uh, the high school was the, it had just been open for one year. Tucson High School, where I went as a freshman year, was the largest high school in the United States of America. They had a, a graduating class of 1,500 seniors because Tucson had exploded in population. So they were building like three high schools at the same time. And I wound up later on actually teaching in the same high school that I graduated from, uh, teaching American government and world history. Um, because I lived in Tucson at that time, <clears throat> and uh, it was inexpensive, I went to the University of Arizona. I could actually walk to the classes myself and graduated there in 1962. Um, I want to hear a little bit, I know your political career started as early as in high school, I believe. You ran for office, so you were interested in being a leader really early on. Um, will you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I will talk about that. I, I um, Yes, uh, ever since getting up in front of the sixth grade class and talking and giving all these reports, then um, people were listening to me. So I did, I was involved in government in middle school. In high school, I was president, uh, president of the girls' student body, vice president of the class, things such as that. One of the big experiences, too, that remain in my mind, one was I uh, was an American Field Service exchange student. I was the first exchange student from my high school. And I spent the summer in Germany with a family that was uh, when I was between my junior and senior year in high school. At that time also, uh, I was fortunate enough to get to go to Girl State, which every state has in the nation. And it's kind of a replica of government. You would run for the city council or some city office and then, and then move on up the chain and ultimately run for governor if you became your party. There are always two parties. And I think it's set up the same way in every state in the nation. Um, and I was one of the candidates for governor. Uh, and um, I lost, uh, that's the only election I've ever lost. I lost by one vote and I didn't vote for myself. <laughs> so that then, I thought that was kind of arrogant to vote for yourself. I now understand that you definitely should vote for yourself. <laughs> so I was involved from high school at the university, the same thing. I was a student body officer at the University of Arizona involved in my sorority, Kappa Alpha Theta. I'll mention them, just for all the Theta people out there. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, I, and I was president of Mortar Board, which was, at that time, the senior woman's honorary. 
and uh, so I've been really involved and so it wasn't any surprise to my friends in Tucson that I came to Nevada having been married and run for office here. After you went to Arizona State University you went to uh, Northwestern. Can we hear a little bit about that? What years did you go to? Yeah, Northwestern? when I graduated uh, from the University of Arizona there was a scholarship given by Phelps Dodge Mining Corporation which is very big in particularly southern Arizona at that time, a copper mine. And uh, they gave one graduate, there were many graduate fellowships, I'm sure, but there was one that they would give to a graduating senior that uh, would pay for everything um, as long as they could get into the school. They didn't care what your, um, what your major was, what your minor was. They were just interested in having you go to a graduate school. So I applied to many, uh, got accepted to uh, several, and I chose Northwestern uh, for the silly reason that I'd never been to Chicago before. As it turns out, it was so difficult and so tough. I also had a job there, but just in addition to getting a master's degree um, was that I got to Chicago once in the entire time, and that was to go to the Newberry Library to do my primary research, because everything had to be done by primary sources. And uh, I did go one of the, no, I take it back, I went a couple times. I also went to see Joan Baez once. And I guess the older people that will know who she is. But I was so far up in, in this, wherever it was held, that I looked down and all I could see was the part in her hair <laughs> because she had long hair at the time and it was parted in the middle. So that was, my, that was the reason I went to Northwestern, but I was very glad I did because it was a great school. And then you went to Ohio State University. I did. I went, then went to Ohio State, and I was assistant dean of women there and uh, ran a residence hall of uh, girls. And I was working on my degree, <clears throat> met my husband, and decided, and he was also working on his Ph.D., not from that institution, but he had gone to Stanford, but he was uh, getting his Ph.D. from the University of Arizona. That's where I had first met him um, in... Uh, in atmospheric, uh, in, uh, in atmospheric physics, and they had a really good, good department in that, in electrical engineering. So I decided one PhD in the family was enough, so uh, I let him have it. <laughs> so then, how did you get to Nevada from there? Well, when he graduated, um, and I'm gonna say, I, I'm gonna say maybe in 68, uh, 60, around 1968, uh, there were no jobs for anybody in electrical engineering. You can imagine now, uh, if you were alive when all the computers and everything are exploding, uh, there were none. And uh, one of his fellow colleagues in the department drove a cab. Uh, he was fortunate because he had an atmospheric physics background as well, that there were a couple of opportunities, um, but just a couple. And one of them was at the Desert Research Institute here and uh, we did travel to, there was one in Boulder, Colorado, and another in uh, North Dakota. And uh, we, chose, uh, we chose DRI. And um, when we moved up here in 1968, uh, I had just been married. I had my son, Kirk, who's now uh, 48. Um, he, he, I had him in Tucson. My husband had already moved up here to start his job and uh, then I moved up here after, after that, after he was born. And there was a terrible flu going around <coughs> at that time from Asia. And uh, so his, his gr other grandparents weren't able to come and see their grandson because nobody could come in. One of the nurses died uh, in the hospital. Uh, one of the children, one of the babies died because of the flu. So it was a really quarantine kind of atmosphere. And when he flew on the airplane up here, just myself and tiny little baby, one month old. Um, we missed the connection, so I had to stay over in Las Vegas. Needless to say, I was not equipped for that, and <clears throat> uh, and put him in a bed in the middle of it and sat up all night and watched to make sure he didn't roll off. I did not know that at one month old, they're not going to know how to roll off. <laughs> that shows you how equipped I was. <laughs> And so we made it, though, well, we made it. And he's now 48, so we made it that far. When you got into government and you decided to first run for public office, you had some very small children. 
Um, so will you tell us a little bit about that decision to run for office and then the experience of having small children? Yeah, it was an interesting experience. I actually had, in 1973, worked for the woman running for the city council, Pat Hardy Lewis. And she was the first woman elected to the city council, as a matter of fact. And so I went to a coffee for her, liked her, offered to help, uh, did. She was the first woman to go door to door, knocking on people's doors. So I kind of understood how to work a campaign, how to logically do it. And um, so she did get elected and she did what was a really great thing and I've done it and I think every woman should. She appointed me to a positions that she had had, but she couldn't then as a member of the city council, such as the city charter commission, such of a Blue Ribbon Task Force on Housing. So I got a little bit of visibility. And um, since I had been bitten by the bug a long time ago, and since I had just experienced this uh, campaign, a successful one, that um, I thought when um, a couple, well, ne the next year, I thought I could run for the a legislature because it's only a part-time job, because you only have to meet every other year. My kids at the time were four and five, and my husband was supportive. Um, and one of the things that, you know, he was in an entirely different field, so he was never in competition with me. He was proud of what I had done and would do and did do. Um, but the kids were uh, a basic um, problem for me in the campaign. I had file cabinets full of all kinds of issues. Um, and uh, sort of like a Hillary Clinton, uh, really into policy. Um, but unfortunately, most of the people were concerned about the age of my children and the fact that I was going to be running for office when they were so little, who was going to take care of them. I'd been uh, told that my, the kids were going to grow up to be juvenile delinquents. They wouldn't amount to anything. My husband was probably going to divorce me. And I was a homewrecker and on and on and on. And uh, it was really tough at some places because um, I remember telling my, I told you that my sister t uh, came and, and spent some time with me, that one day I just didn't want to go to this function uh, because it, the rumor had been all over the place. I mean, it, not the rumor, I mean the truth, but the, the description of it was um, pretty far reaching, at least I thought it was. But I did go and um, obviously I had to. And um, it became an issue, uh, but you know, I had uh, two men running against me in the Republican primary and we were all the same age, but I don't think they ever were asked about their small children or if they even had them or did they do much as a father with them. And my children today, my son's an attorney. Uh, my uh, daughter has two master's degrees and has her own business and uh, they're pretty successful, both of them. So. I think it uh, can work out pretty well. Mm -hmm. And you did end up winning, of course. I did. So I did. How did you overcome? That well, I, th I think that, you know, I have to say, I'd like to think it was all because of my outstanding background and personality, but I have to admit, I think it's because I had two men running against me in the primary, and I, I don't know if it's true, but they could have split the vote, and I was the unusual one. So I was elected. I don't know if that's true, but uh, it could well possibly be the case. And the man, one of the men that uh, I defeated in that primary had lost the election to the city council woman, the election before when she ran for city council, she ran against him in the primary. And so a woman beat him twice. And uh, I understand he wasn't real happy about that. But actually at the end of the day, uh, we become friends, and the other uh, candidate, um, we're very good friends, and he's told me that he was happy that I won because he never would have worked as hard as I did. So, you know, you can have opponents and still, and still have a nice relationship with them when it's all over. But, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a tough campaign, but I went door to door, and I have to mention the American Association of University Women, AAUW, if it hadn't been for them, I don't think I would have run because they wanted to focus on a woman. That was their goal that year, to get a woman elected to the legislature. And every, I had 19 precincts in my assembly district and every single day, one of them would come and meet me and we would walk and we did all the 19 precincts and I did them all again in the general election. Although it was pretty well thought that a Republican would win this assembly seat, 
uh, because previous to my election, we had a doctor in this district, Dr. Robert Broadbent, who was well-known, well-liked. He ran for the assembly, was elected, but he uh, thought that people should listen to him because he was a doctor, and there was a bill uh, legalizing acupuncture. Well, he just thought that was one of the worst pieces of leg you know, potential legislation that he'd ever heard about. So he, of course, talked against it, as a medical doctor might, and nobody listened to him, and it passed. So he was pretty disgusted with the legislative process. And so I, uh, I, I realized that uh, I should go and meet him and let him know that I was going to be running. And I didn't know whether he was going to run again or not. And, um, and the same, this, well, I did go. I practiced what I was going to say. And I was kind of a little, a little nervous about it. We had a great conversation. And I'm very glad I did because I think it made a huge difference because one of, the, one of my male opponents, his best friend was chairman of the Republican Party in the state. And so they went together to convince this Dr. Broadbent that he should endorse this young man. And he said, no, I just met this really nice lady. And he said, I think I'm going to stay out of the race. And that was really, I think, a benefit for me because if he had endorsed the, the young man, his name was Alex Kanwitz, uh, who was an insurance broker here in town, um, then that might have made a difference. So it, it, you know, it, it paid off in many ways, I think. Do you feel like it was a big step to be the one uh, endorsed instead of the young man? I mean, you the I wasn't endorsed. He just stayed neutral. He just stayed neutral. Yeah, which was fine by me. I just didn't want him endorsing anybody else. Uh, but, um, you know, it was a, in, in some races, in the next race, I didn't have an opponent, either Republican or Democrat, but I still went and knocked on every door again because my feeling was if it wasn't their fault that they didn't have a choice, you know, so I should go and listen to what they had to say and, and what their concerns were. So then you served in the Assembly and you mm -hmm. served in the Senate mm -hmm. and then you decided to run for Lieutenant Governor. Can we get <coughs> can you just a history of how you went through each office and why you decided to run for yeah. those positions? Yeah, um, I served um, from 1975 to 1980 in the Assembly and uh, that was the days that and we will talk about this, I'm sure the Equal Rights Amendment was a big part of that. And, uh, but I, I, uh, I was able to, I think, be fairly successful. There were very few women in the Assembly. There was only one woman in the Senate at the time. Um, and, uh, but I, uh, I, I, I think one of the assets that women can have in politics really is is being involved in something that men also like. And I'm a big sports fan. And so I had a real communication with some other men about with sports and talking about baseball and a variety of things. And I think they felt comfortable that I wasn't some raving feminist that had come out from Washoe County to take over the, the legislature in the world. And so I was, I think, uh, did a, a fairly credible job, got a lot of bills passed. Um, and. Uh, I then went to the Senate when the uh, Cliff Young, Senator Cliff Young, was the senator along with Senator Bill Raggio at the time in 1980, and they ran kind of you could you could vote for two people. It was a multi-member district, so it was larger, but you could elect two. They always kind of ran as a team, and they would put a big ad in the newspaper where you could fill out what your concerns were, what how you felt about this issue and that issue. Well, Cliff had decided he wasn't going to run anymore. And he came to me in the assembly and said he would like me to take his place, which was a really big deal. And um, so he actually, I, I uh, said I'd like to do that. And um, he actually went to the uh, Washoe County Republican Convention and also the state convention and endorsed me. And um, so I was in, gonna run, and then my husband was killed at that same time. And so I really, had to rethink the whole thing again. But he and I had discussed this before this accident happened, and I uh, felt that he would have wanted me to continue, and um, so I did. But uh, one of the um, uh, dilemmas I had was that I did not want to run as a team with Senator Bill Raggio, and I did not want to do an ad in the newspaper with him, so I didn't. And um, many of the women 
who supported me uh, decided that even though you could vote for two people, they'd only vote for one. So I actually got more votes than he did. And that was a problem that I had in the future in the Senate. I didn't realize it at the time, but it did become one. And uh, I guess that's all I want to say on that. I served a th a terms in from 1980 to 1990 in the Senate. And at that time, uh, a Brian McKay, who was our attorney general, a charismatic kind of candidate, uh, asked if I'd like to run, um, he was going to run for governor, if I'd like to run for lieutenant governor. And so I thought about it and did all the th due diligence that one should do. And I said yes. As it turned out, he did not run. So I was there by myself. And normally you combine, even though you may be, uh, you, you kind of combine trips and do everything. There's this parade on this date and this barbecue on that date. So you sort of organize your campaigns. <clears throat> but he pulled out. And um, I believe it was because the gaming industry was not going to support him, what were going to support Bob Miller, and so which they did. Um, so I ran, and I don't even remember who ran for governor, to be honest with you. It was just somebody, I think he lived up at Lake Tahoe, that ran. And so I ran, I ran again by myself, and I had two uh, uh, great people who. Um, who managed worked on my campaign to begin with, and um, the lieutenant governor's campaign, of course, was quite different because it was a statewide, and um, and uh, when I was running uh, for the to, for the primary election, uh, we went on Labor Day. We went as one is d does to a lot of rural towns for picnics and barbecues and that sort of thing, pancake breakfasts. Well, we were in Fallon, and we were on our way to Carson City in uh, Bob Seal's uh, plane, Cessna 411. And unfortunately, it took off, but didn't take off very high, and crashed. And uh, uh, his wife was killed. And uh, there were five people in the plane at Hell 6. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, my campaign manager, Stephanie Tyler, who was seated across from me, our seats were positioned facing the back of the plane, and they should not have been. They should have been facing this direction, but one didn't know that at the time. And I should have been smart enough to get into some of these small planes after I'd lost my own husband in another plane. But unfortunately, when you're in a campaign, you don't think about that. You're just going to be somewhere at this time on that date. And um, so that, um, that was extremely difficult. Um, I was shipped down to um, Sacramento. And um, to make a long story short, I was in a body cast in a hospital bed for the entire primary to the general election. And so whatever I did, uh, I did over the phone. Um, interviewed by newspapers, had to do it over the phone. I, did, I was forced to have a press conference in my living room um, right, after the right after the accident because my opponent uh, was saying I'd been brain damaged in the camp, in the plane crash, and so I shouldn't be running for, and I shouldn't serve if elected. So I had to have a press conference, <clears throat> and I had my living room filled with reporters who I knew from my legislative days. And when it was all over, they said she's just as honorary and cantankerous as she's always been. So we didn't see any change. So, <clears throat> but that was the the ugly side of politics, and uh, there is some of that. But anyway, fortunately, I did win the election. It was difficult getting through those f first four years. Uh, I had uh, less of a body cast, but somewhat. And I had a great friend who was in the assembly, Joni Lambert, who made a lot. She was a great seamstress. She made a lot of clothes for me that I could fit over this body cast, um, you know, that I, I could cover it up, basically. And so after the four years, it was clear that um, I was not really up to physically going and running again. Um, and um, that same election in 1990, uh, at the very end of the last legislative session when I was in the Senate, the Supreme Court handed down another decision dealing with Roe versus Wade. And uh, Senator Raggio and myself, um, we, we disagreed on the issue, but we came to an agreement that if we brought up this issue now, this was in June, the Supreme Court hands down their decisions in June, 
and we would string the, elect the session out for another month or so. So in that interim period, I did some research and found out that there was something called a referendum. Uh, when you have a law in the books, in their Nevada revised statutes, you can ask people to either affirm it or vote yes or not. If they affirm it, then that means that that particular section of the law will remain, and if not, they will be removed. Well, in 1973, Roe v. Wade, the, the structure of it, the trimester approach, was put in our law, uh, unbeknownst to me, because I came in in 1975 and nothing was said about it, but it was there, so I brought this issue to Planned Parenthood and said, we can take care of this in one fell swoop. We won't have to deal with it all the time. They were very concerned about it. They were afraid that people might turn it down. I, I did, didn't have a doubt at all. It was called Campaign for Choice. It was a rigorous campaign, not done by me. It was just my idea. Other people did all the work. And it passed uh, affirmatively by about 65% of, of Nevadans who voted. Uh, so that was that, to me, is one of the more important things that I have done is, is you know, think up the idea, not the, not the work, because I was running my own campaign or not, <laughs> or in a bed or whatever. The topic of important legislation, the ERA, just passed this year, but you played a big role in it 45 years ago. So do you want to talk a little bit about the ERA then and now? Well, we would have been the uh, 35th state. Uh, you need 38, and uh, it was uh, it, it passed quickly when it first came out. Uh, all the states approved it, ratified it, but then it stalled down uh, because of certain <coughs> uh, women who felt that they did not want to be equal. I'll be very honest about it. They wanted to be uh, exceptional and put on a pedestal, or they felt they should be privileged. And uh, mainly, the uh, major opponent was Phyllis Schlafly. She had an organization that she created called Eagle Forum. She had been very disappointed. She wanted to be the national president of the National Republican Women's Clubs, and she was defeated. So she decided to set up this other organization in competition with it. So uh, they came up with, uh, in my mind, absurd reasons why women should not be equal. And unfortunately, uh, too many people listened to them, and it, would, it was like, it was like a bill this was a fundamental right for women to be equal. People would trade it off. It would pass in the assembly one year, the Senate would kill it. The Senate would introduce it and it would pass and the assembly would kill it. I mean, it was that they didn't care at all uh, what, it, what it really was. And uh, at one time, uh, people had made buttons that said the 13 who lied and uh, gave them to all the men that had promised that they would vote for it, they did not. And it was put on an advisory vote because people didn't want, people would stack up postcards, guys would, and say, look, I had 50 here that went for it, and uh, 50 in favor, and 110 against. So I'm voting for the, the 110. And so it was put on the ballot, <clears throat> and uh, it was defeated. Uh, the state of Nevada did not think that women should be equal. The only district in my Senate district um, that approved it was up in Incline Village. Other than that, almost every other precinct in my Senate district voted no. And I had people ask me, would I please just vote the way the vote, the ballot came out? And I said, no, I'm going to vote for it, whether it passes or not. And how do you feel now that it has been passed? Well, you know, that was pretty exciting. I just, uh, it's 45 years too late to be part of uh, our national constitution. It would be nice to think that other states that were close, that have passed it in one house, but maybe not in the other, would see that Nevada had done it. And there's nothing to say that it could not be with the right Congress uh, resurrected again and started all over again. There has been another amendment to the Constitution that started when the, when the Constitution was drafted that was just ratified a little while ago. So I think there are some legal things that could be tried um, but it was a big disappointment, I think, for me and for several of my uh, female colleagues. Um, but, and they would have been very pleased that it was passed this last session. And I knew it was going to pass because the Democrats had made it a commitment that they were all going to support it. But I was very interested in my own two legislators, my assemblywoman and my senator, who are both women. 
And so I lobbied them rather extensively, and they were the only Republicans in each house to vote for it. And my assemblywoman was very disappointed that I wasn't able to sit with her that day. But actually, uh, a, she doesn't, didn't know this at the time, but there is a rule that only a legislator can sit in a, in a certain seat, and it's the one I would have had to have sit in, sat in, because it swiveled and had a high back. And uh, she said, well, I, you can sit in my chair. She didn't realize that back in the 70s, and I was there when some intern, the, the, his, his legislator, took off on a Friday afternoon and headed for Las Vegas, and so he sat in his seat and actually voted the way that the legislator, he thought he would have voted. So that's a no-no. So uh, I sat in a seat by the, the speaker's seat because he's never in his chair. He's up presiding over the assembly. So, but I was very, very pleased to have a nice picture of the three of us uh, supporting it. And we all represented this particular assembly, District 15, because our senator uh, is, well, also was an assemblywoman previously to this district. So that's kind of neat. It was a huge moment. I was there, um, you know, in the gallery watching. And uh, talk a little bit about that pause when people didn't know what to do. Yeah, it was <clears throat> when it finally passed, um, there was this silence because myself and everybody in the gallery, and there were hundreds of women, I believe, there. And uh, nobody knew whether to applaud, to whistle, to clap, to stand up. And until the speaker called recess, and that's the time when you can do things like that. So, yeah, it was exciting. Great. Um, so I want to hear a little bit about some role models in your life, um, and mentors and people that inspired you. Well, some of the mentors, and I'll be brief, um, I think that you start back with Margaret Chase, Margaret Chase Smith, the first United States senator that I'd ever met. And I would say I'd put Pat Hardy Lewis in that category, whose campaign I worked on and helped elect to the Reno City Council. Um, I think that uh, Senators Gene Ford, Mary Gojack, uh, they had been to the legislature before myself. And uh, particularly, I have to say, Senator Mary jo Gojack really encouraged me to run. Even though we were of different parties, she was a Democrat, um, she had my husband meet her husband and convince him this was a great thing, and she really tried very hard, as did Jean, although I did not do Jean that well, because Mary lived here and Jean lived in Las Vegas. Um, I think those are the, you know, and uh, my, I guess my own mother, uh, I would put in that category as well. I want to hear you we're on the Gaming Commission, so I want to hear a little bit about that experience. Well, after, the, uh, after my tenure as Lieutenant Governor, which was four years, uh, I couldn't run again. I didn't feel I was physically able. Uh, Bob Miller was enthusiastic about my running again, but uh, I decided not. But he did offer that any job you want, I will appoint you to. And uh, he offered several agency heads, and I said that would not be it would not fit because if I could do that, go to Carson City every day, I'd have been run for lieutenant governor again. And so he said, what do you want? And I said, I'd like to be on the Gaming Commission. It's part time. Uh, it meets uh, once a month, once in Carson City and then the next month in Las Vegas. You can do all the reading and there's a tremendous amount of reading at home that I could do that in, you know, in a comfortable position and then just go down for the meetings and it paid a salary and it was the most important appointed position in the state because we regulate the number one industry in Nevada. So I waited till the uh, another appointment opened up and he did appoint me and so I served on the Gaming Commission for 12 years after uh, my being a lieutenant governor. So it kept me in politics in, a, in an interesting way. I did mention to Tess one of the more interesting people that we had when I was on the Gaming Commission that came to get a gaming license was our current president of the United States. And uh, Mr. Trump was pretty upset that he had to come to Carson City, this small little podunky place, to go before the Gaming Commission and would have preferred if he had been able to go to the meeting in Las Vegas. But he wasn't able to do that. And so I was serving on the Gaming Commission at the height of his television reality show. Maybe I could say today is his reality show by being president rather than The Apprentice, but I think he's living in a reality world myself. But, um, 
And so I know a lot about Donald Trump that other people don't, that I cannot ever talk about. And after my oral history was done, uh, they were going to do another one on the gaming, on gaming commissioners, but they realized that most of us couldn't talk about things that we knew because it's all, everything that you read is shredded. In fact, in, when it comes in boxes, gaming agents have to take those boxes from my house to the airport, put them on a plane. They must be taken off in Las Vegas by another gaming agent, taken into their car, delivered to the gaming control board offices, put in a locked room. They are unopened, the room is unlocked when we have a meeting, and the minute the meeting's open, they're taken back in the boxes and shredded. So uh, there wasn't much to say in that oral history, so they decided not to do one on the gaming commission, which is kind of too bad, but we, we couldn't, we couldn't <laughs> say very much. But needless to say, I can say this, that Donald Trump's place in Las Vegas, he doesn't have gaming. I'll leave it at that. Sue, I have a copy of your oral history right here, and I want listeners to know that it's available through the Nevada Women's History Project, and we'll give more information at the end of this interview. My understanding is that uh, this oral history is also located in all the high schools in the state and at universities, as well as the Nevada State, state Library. Well, I hope during my lifetime that we are able to elect a female governor, but I do know that you were able to serve as governor for a couple days, so do you want to tell us about that experience? I also agree with you that I hope in my lifetime that we elect a woman governor, but I was able to fill in for the governor, Bob Miller, who was at a state for a couple of days, so I was the acting governor, and uh, if you notice in the picture, I have a bouquet on, and I think that that was given to me by people in the, uh, in the Senate uh, in order to commemorate that particular day. In terms of transformative experiences, I think our viewers might want to know um, about you switching political parties. So can we hear a little bit about that? That probably was the biggest transformative experience in my life. I've been a Republican. As I mentioned, my dad had been chairman of the party in Maine, and I'd been a Republican uh, mm -hmm. since I was 21. And, uh, but it was clear to me, even being in the legislature, that I was a very moderate, uh, moderate Republican, and I was pretty um, tight on fiscal issues, but very liberal on social issues. And so I didn't quite fit sometimes, I think, and I think some of my colleagues felt the same way. Uh, but then it became, when the Tea Party came into existence, it just seemed to be too much. The reason I stayed as a Republican this long, that long, was because I was elected as a Republican and people, uh, I felt that I had some obligation to the voters that had selected me that way. But then it got to be overwhelming to me that it was becoming way too conservative. And uh, so I just made the decision. I happened to be doing a large interview with Ray Hager, who was the Reno Gazette Journal political editor. And uh, he did a, a big feature. And I told him that at some point the next month, I was gonna go down and change my party. And I said, uh, I'll call you when I do it. So he went with me and it didn't make the news. I was on MSNBC and a variety of other television programs explaining why I had done it. The very reason that you asked me that question because it was a transformative. And I did have other people from around the country say that they were gonna change too. And uh, so that was kind of, that was, and I, and I felt very comfortable doing it. I'm not a political party person. That's why I became a nonpartisan. The only problem with that is that you cannot vote in a primary in this state. And I doubt if that's ever gonna be changed. So in that case, there was one race that it would have made a difference, uh, but that's the only one that I can remember, so. So Sue, how would you like to be remembered? Oh, that's a, that's a huge question. Um, I guess it's not up to me as to how I'm remembered, but I guess I would like to be remembered as somebody who stood by her principles that had beliefs and stuck with them. I remember a particular experience when the Equal Rights Amendment issue was on the ballot and I had lunch with the Senate Majority Leader, a Democrat, who was um, absolutely opposed to it. And he told me that he thought that he and myself would be the only two that would vote according to their principles regardless of the vote of the issue on the ballot. And that's exactly how I felt. I believe that I, I, I represented people in this district that might not have been represented before. Um, I felt that uh, I can th think of all the many issues 
displaced homemakers, people that, women that were, um, that all of a sudden were left with, by divorce, by uh, death, um, and hadn't been in the workforce for a long time, that I created a couple of centers around the state, uh, a variety of things that I think people, particularly, not just particularly women, I was very interested in prison system, created halfway houses, residential housing, um, foster children, um, a variety of things that I uh, had interest in, and I feel that I represented people that didn't necessarily have a voice before, um, and I think that's uh, why I'd like to be remembered. Do you have a message to give to young women? Well, I think that thinking back on myself when I was 34 and made a momental uh, decision uh, with small children and uh, doing, going off and doing this thing that really hadn't been done a whole lot. I was advised to run for the school board when my kids got older and everything. And I said, no, I didn't want to wait that long because if young women don't get involved in the political process, there's not a time enough left to maybe be governor of the state of Nevada or maybe even president of the United States. And so I think that one should, young women should not listen to people that urge them to wait because times would be better. I think they should, if they feel the, the need and the interest and that they feel they can add something to the political process, they should run at that time. You know, I took a risk. It was a big risk I took. And it worked out well, I think, for everybody. I would like to think that. And so I think young women have to look at that in terms of if you feel that it's important and you're 25 or you're 35, do it. I know that a lot of young women are interested in running for office, but what are the steps they need to take? How do, what do they do in order to run for office, in order to be prepared to run for office? Well, I think preparation <clears throat> comes with what your interests are. The reason I really ran in the year I did was because Richard Nixon was a Republican and he was being accused of lying uh, to the United States of America, and I felt that Republicans needed to step forward at that time and represent there are good people in the Republican Party. It was kind of um, it was kind of disastrous that this was happening to our president and he happened to be in that party. I think that the first thing that young women should do uh, would be maybe uh, understand that if they have a real commitment, a real passion, I wanted to open government up based upon Richard Nixon's performance. So I introduced a lot of bills that dealt with lobbyist disclosure, uh, not being able to collect a whole lot of money, a variety of those kinds of things, common cause type uh, issues. Uh, I think that a woman, first of all, should, should really believe that they could do it, that they had a commitment, they just didn't want to run for office just for the heck of it. I think that maybe they should go to their political parties, whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans, uh, to, be, to ask for experience because I know that there are a variety of groups, I won't mention them by name, that are training young women today in this state to run for office, and I think we'll see more of those. Uh, one group, I'm actually working with a young woman in Coronado, California, who is interested in running for Congress. She's been, she's already met her United States Senator. She's been to the Women's um, a Political Caucus uh, Day Workshop, and so there are those kinds of um, variety of uh, skills and tools which were not available when I first ran. Well, Sue, it has been a pleasure talking to you today, so I just want to thank you so much for the time that you've given us for this interview. It was my pleasure. Thank you.